Hey, before we get started this week, I just wanted to give everyone a quick update on BJJ Mental Models Premium. I think at this point we've got over 32 hours of educational jujitsu material on there. We just launched a new seven-part premium series with Rob Bernacki, another six-part premium series with Preet Mikkelsen, so a lot of good reasons to check out Premium if you haven't already. Please do take a second and do me a favor, check it out, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. There is a free trial, so you can check it out at no cost. Again, if you haven't looked already, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 171. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, pleased to be joined by Meg He. Meg, how are you doing? Extremely well. I'm happy to be here. I am happy to have you here. I've been looking forward to having you on for a while. You pass my Instagram test, which is one of the things that I like to do when I try to figure out who I want to follow on Instagram is I take a look at all of the people that I like and I see who they're following and then I just follow the same people. And you're one of those people. Pretty much everyone I know in jujitsu that I like seems to follow you. So I'm happy to have you on here because I think you've got a very unique skill set that's going to be really helpful to our listeners. But before we dig into that and the topic du jour, why don't you do a favor here for myself and for the crew and just introduce yourself for the listeners. Sure. My name is Meg. I probably have the honor of being the person who's worse at jujitsu to ever appear on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I am pretty proud of this though. So I am a blue belt at Unity Jiu-Jitsu in New York under Marilla Santana, Margot Ciccarelli. I am also Margot's romantic partner, but in the rest of the world, I am a tech founder. I run an e-commerce company called A-Day, which is a venture-backed company where we make sustainable apparel. But my background really comes from technology and business. And I think it's been very interesting for me to get to know the jujitsu world, especially having, you know, seen a lot of other sports industries and how they operate. And now having seen how jujitsu operates, and there's really a vast difference. That is a very polite way to describe it. Yes, it is very, very, very vast in terms of the difference between jujitsu and what I guess we could refer to as the real world. I sometimes joke that the B in BJJ stands for backwater because this whole sport <laughs> is very backwater and unevolved in a lot of ways, mostly just due to the fact that it is still very small, very new, very niche. There's not a lot of organizational culture and uh, policies that kind of give jujitsu that air of professionalism that you would see in other sports. And there's also just a general lack of good quality education for jujiteros about how to build a jujitsu business. We've talked about this at length on the podcast that most people who decide to make a profession out of jujitsu, they were never trained in how to do this. Oftentimes, they don't really have great mentorship or great guidance on how to do this. They're just competitors or jujitsu enthusiasts who one day just decided, I want to start a gym or I want to start some other jujitsu business, and they just do it. And a mm -hmm. lot of it is just kind of done by winging it and just through passion and grit and determination. They're able to make it work sometimes, but a lot of the time it's not really done in the most efficient way. So you see a lot of businesses in the space, and I think most listeners would agree to this. A lot of the businesses in the BJJ space are basically held together by duct tape and popsicle sticks. And your background as a tech entrepreneur and also as a fashion entrepreneur is super interesting to me because I'm sure that with your experience, you come into this and you probably have some good advice for people in the space. And I'd love to dig into that in terms of how we can help people be more financially successful if they choose to make a go out of it in jujitsu. Yeah, absolutely. I would say the first thing here is I think that the back quarter is not necessarily a bad thing. And I think the industry is incredibly young, right? But I also think that there's a lot of opportunity. And I think that the more that we can start to have these conversations about how do people in jujitsu earn more money and what can we do change, I think that there's a lot of responsiveness in the industry and that people are very willing to change to, you know, pressure sponsors to um, ask gyms for more. And I think that sort of hope and determination is a really important part. I think there's something else that's really interesting, even in what you've just said, which is there's an assumption that 
to make more money in jujitsu, you have to open a gym. And I think there's actually a lot of models where you do, that's not the case, but people don't really know about it. Yes. So I think we can dive into all of those things as well. Well, a good starting point on this is to perhaps talk about your compensation survey if you're ready to do that. I know that you have been promoting and capturing data on a jujitsu compensation survey. Are you at a point now where you can share any preliminary insights that you've discovered from getting all of that feedback from the community? Yeah, so this was something I've been passionate about for a while. So when I first met Margot, it was just not clear to me how she made money. I would say, you know, we've been together probably, this is like our third year now, and it's still not entirely clear to me how she makes money. (laughs) But I tried to do my best. What I realized was, you know, I think it's not clear to a lot of jujitsu people how they make money. This wasn't a problem that was unique to Margot. And You know, I think in other industries, especially when you're negotiating for a new job or trying to decide what you want to do next, there's usually these compensation surveys. You can figure out whether you're getting a fair offer, right? You can say, hey, I am a marketing manager and I live in Seattle and, you know, I have this much experience and it tells you actually this is how much you're supposed to get paid. And the more that we started visiting different schools, the more I saw these price disparities. And at first I thought, you know, was this just because people didn't know how much they were supposed to charge? And so, you know, when I saw a brown belt in the same city charge like $100, but a different brown belt in the same city charge $50 per hour, I thought at first that maybe we should just do a survey so that people could figure out how much they're supposed to charge for privates. But the more that I got to understand how people really made money in jujitsu, I think the biggest takeaway was that people, especially competitors and especially gym owners, just didn't really understand how they were supposed to make money in jujitsu. I think especially with top competitors, there was this understanding that as long as you won stuff, then you would be able to kind of make money. And so if you win Black Belt Worlds, you would instantly have newfound fame and suddenly be able to, you know, sell instructionals and sell seminars and all these people would turn up. And that just simply isn't true. And that's basically how the compensation survey started. Yeah, there's a lot of broke world champions out there. And I I hear exactly what you're saying. I think people think that if you can succeed at that level, then profit is guaranteed. But that that is far from the case. If you don't have a cohesive plan for what you're doing and you don't price yourself out at a fair price, you may wind up never profiting from your success. Whereas meanwhile, there are a lot of people in the sport who do quite well and don't have that competitive record, but just they're very, very good coaches or they have better business sense and they're able to succeed financially despite the fact that they don't have that track record. So that said, there are a lot of people who have managed to both win at the highest levels and then build successful businesses on top of that. But like you said, it's important to know that that level of financial success is not guaranteed just because you're an ace competitor. Being a financial expert is a completely different skill set than being a jujitsu expert. And so when it comes time to starting your own business in the space, you're basically a white belt all over again. And I would agree that the best advice you can get out of the gate would be to find someone who can kind of help coach you along this path. That's something I certainly wish I had had earlier on as well. Yeah, I think that's, you know, absolutely spot on. I think the main difference is that in many sports with like a more established professional tour like tennis, your earnings really directly correlated to winning in the sport. And so the moment that you experience some element of success, you get a manager or an agent who helps you, you know, figure out how do we monetize you more? How do we monetize your following? How do we get you to sponsorships? And essentially, how do we, you know, make you make sense? But that doesn't really happen in jujitsu because you don't make money out of winning winning stuff generally, right? <laughs> like the most that anyone's ever won was that spied invitation on that happened once and that was for hundred K. But other than that, you know, it's sort of pockets of prizes at somewhere between like 10 to 20 K, which isn't worth enough for any manager or agent to really get interested in. And so as a result, like I think the best way for competitors to think of themselves is you know, in order to thrive as a competitor financially and commercially, they have to think of themselves primarily as an influencer. So I think that, you know, more important than winning things, it's really about winning on English speaking social media, 
really entertaining the audience during world-class jiu-jitsu matches. And in particular here, I think people have to peak at the right time when the audience is watching rather than, you know, just be consistently good. And also, you know, they have to be really known for their style of jiu-jitsu, personality, ability to teach. Uh, and I think a really good example here is Lachlan Giles, you know, who has been good for so long. And I think a lot of people just had no idea, but he really peaked at the right time, you know, during the ADCC open class and people really saw him, they understood and they know him for leg locks. So instantly, you know, you understood Lachlan Giles, leg locks, I get it. That's why I follow him. That's why I look at his social media. That's why I buy his instructionals. And that became a very easy idea to understand and also to kind of monetize off because then he could do seminars, which said Lachlan Giles, leg logs, come and buy my seminar, come and spend all this <laughs> money. But I think without that, you know, there are a lot of, you know, black belt world champions who are just pretty anonymous. Like you maybe have seen them on a podium, but you have no idea who they are, or what they stand for. And I don't think you have to be known for your fight style even. You can really be known for your personality, but people need to be able to ascribe something to you and to understand what it is that they're paying you for. Because essentially for competitors, people are not really kind of paying you to teach. You're more trying to monetize your fame and your following. Yeah, and I think it's also worth pointing out that that is not as vapid or shallow as it sounds. When you say you need to monetize your following and that it's all about having a reputation, that does sound like we're kind of living in this weird world where being an Instagram influencer is the only thing that matters. But it's actually not that vapid. And this is something that I have learned having done this podcast. I am not really a, a big fan of social media. And an error that I made early on in this podcast is that I didn't really focus on our social following. I focused on making making good content on getting it out there on putting it in places where the eyeballs would be. But I didn't really focus on building our own Instagram following, especially. And that was kind of a miscalculation because I didn't realize how important, especially Instagram is in the jujitsu community and having a bigger following makes it so much easier to get anything done. It's not about just posting shallow pics and trying to win a popularity contest, but it's about giving potential customers an idea, not just of what your product is like, but what your personality is like. Because BJJ is such a personality and influencer driven business. And I find that a lot of the reason people would perhaps pay me is not because they necessarily want my database of cutting edge arm bars or particular <laughs> techniques, but it's because they buy into the type of person that I am. They resonate with me and what I say, and they're interested in pursuing that path and hearing what a person like me would say or a person like me would teach. And all of that is possible because social media allows you to express your personality. So I'd say that for the people out there who, like me, were very hesitant to engage in social, I think that you kind of have to, you know, you have to grin and bear it and you have to do it if you want to succeed in the jujitsu space. It's just very hard to be successful in this space, particularly without having a good size social following, at least out of the gate. Yeah. And I think that, you know, for anyone who is less optimistic on social media, you know, I would probably, you know, not even use any of these words, like let's not use influence and let's not use following. I think this is really about just, you know, reaching as many people as possible. But also I think social media has just played such a massive role in the democratization of jujitsu techniques, right? Like, whereas like even five to 10 years ago, you had to travel to the top academies and then maybe you weren't allowed into pro training and then they wouldn't show you their secret techniques. And and now everything is on Instagram and YouTube. And that is such a huge difference, especially for people who are in areas of the world where, you know, maybe they're never going to even see a black belt ever. But now they can study all these techniques on YouTube. And I think that especially when we look at, you know, people like Lachlan who are able to explode and be known for a particular thing, that is really only possible now through the beauty of social media. And so I think when I use the word influence, I definitely don't mean it as a very vapid way. But I think it's a way for, you know, us to be able to kind of teach and grow and also to really share ideas with as many people as possible. And ultimately, I think that is how we as a sport grow. Yeah, I would say that one of the things that has really surprised me about building up this podcast is how it has changed my relationships with the people I know in this sport and the friendships that I've made, especially consider that as of this recording, 
BJJ Mental Models has been basically a pandemic podcast, right? I mean, we, my brother and I started this thing at the beginning of 2019. So we kind of had a year where we got this thing off the ground and got traction, but most of our, our content and most of our success has come about during the pandemic. And this has led to a ton of opportunities for me to virtually meet people all over the world. And I realized, you know, at this point in time, a lot of my closest friends in the sport are people I've never met at all. You know, some of them I've never even actually spoken to. I just exchanged messages with. It was kind of weird meeting (laughs) meeting your partner, Margot, because we've collaborated so much. Yeah, we've (laughs) collaborated so much online. I thought I wasn't sure if she was a human being or a meme, but I met her and actually she is a real human being. She's not a figment of everyone's imagination. And that is one of the weird things about creating a jujitsu business online is you have the possibility to engage the entire world and to meet interesting people that you would never otherwise get the chance to meet. I think for that reason, for almost anyone who has an interest in digging deep into jujitsu and maybe taking a go out of it, you do need to establish your persona online and make sure that people can find and follow you. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, if you are someone who finds social media to be a taxing chore, then perhaps you're not approaching it the right way. And I would say that when you are able to kind of embrace who you are fully and authentically on social media, that it should feel less like a chore. And maybe you are trying to post what other people are posting or expecting you to post. And maybe that is what feels untruthful to yourself. So I think, you know, you should just post whatever the hell you like. It should be an indication of who you are, um, what you believe in, what you want to express. And hopefully that will be more fun, but also allow people to discover you for the real you. Yeah, I think that if you are attempting to please everyone on social media, you're going to wind up creating very bland vanilla content that won't stand out. And this is a a challenge that I think most people are going to have is it is scary to put your opinions out there because you will get pushback if you say anything other than the most bland vanilla thing ever. And I I think that it is worth preparing people for the kind of pushback you can get on social media, because it certainly caught me off guard as we started building a platform here. I didn't really think anyone was ever going to listen to this podcast when we started it. And I was I was shocked, actually. Right now, as far as I can tell, we may be the number one jujitsu podcast in the world. And that's shocking because that was never the intent when we started this thing. And it is weird because... I find now when you take a a stand on something and you express an opinion, especially if it's an unpopular one or one that has a lot of derision behind it, you open yourself up to a lot of online abuse. And that is something that people need to be prepared for. I mean, I would actually say that this is something I would try to teach people if they were trying to make a go in the jujitsu space doing anything other than creating a local gym. I think it's worth preparing people for the fact that, yes, you should be totally authentic, but you also have to be prepared for the trolls and and the weird pushback you're going to get. And really, you have to have a strategy for how you deal with that, which honestly, the best strategy is usually just to ignore it, but it is going to happen. And that's something that I think people need to understand. Yeah, I think it can be incredibly upsetting, but also I think in order to create content that's really authentic, it can be really hard. So one of the things I started doing, I think also sometime during the pandemic is for some of my favorite grapplers, if I thought that their grappling like level didn't match up with their social media following, I essentially just started like sending them social media tips. And so I've been messaging Brianna St. Marie since she was a purple belt. And I, you know, like you, I have all these online friends who I haven't met before. And I just started messaging her one day. And we now like talk quite a lot. I've never met her. And at one point, you know, a couple of months ago, I started pestering her to make reels. And she like, honestly, she really, really hates social media. Um, I think I think she likes it more now, but she made a reel and she wrote on it. Why did this reel take me three hours and three holes angrily punch into the wall to make someone send me a teenager? So this stuff is like, it's not easy. But I think the right way to think about it is to think about this as part of your job, right? It's not, you know, Instagram is is not necessarily even fun. But in order to be, you know, a full-time professional athlete these days, especially in jujitsu, this is part of your job. So you need to take it as seriously as your training. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people 
they try to avoid or downplay the importance of the promotional aspect of the job. But you're right. It is equally important as your training because you can be the best grappler in the world. But if nobody knows about you or nobody follows you or nobody even know, and this is a very common problem, nobody even knows that you're selling something, then you have an issue. There's a lot of really awesome grapplers. And if you dig through their social media, you'll find out they're actually selling really cool products and services, but you'll never know about it because they simply don't do a good job of hammering the nail in and making sure that people actually want to, you know, even know that this product exists. And awareness is a big part of it as well. If you're just mm-hmm. posting technique videos, I mean, that is definitely going to get you some traction. But at the end of the day, you also have to have a plan to drive people to whatever it is you're trying to make money off of. And I think, you know, in the compensation survey, we especially saw this. And I say we, but it was really just me. But, you know, I <laughs> <laughs> like to be less Margo was here. busy rolling around <laughs> upside down and trying to figure out new ways to tie people up in their pajamas. We know that she wasn't doing the survey. But she helped me promote it. So thank you, Margo, for helping me promote it. <laughs> but so there was a tremendous response. So we had hundreds of people respond and it really ranged from all over the spectrum, starting from like, you know, blue belt coaches who just teach kids classes, purple belts who are first time gym owners, really internationally well-known black belts, a number of IBJJF, you know, black belt world champions, a number of ADCC vets. So really the whole spectrum. And what was really interesting were, you know, I had a notes section at the very bottom for questions people could ask. And it was just full of questions like, hey, I, I've won like black belt wars. I should be getting paid more for my seminars. Like, why are people not paying me more for my seminars? And I think, you know, that really goes to the heart of what we're talking about here, which is people, you know, you need to have a following. You need to have people who want to pay you for your seminars in order for that to happen. And then sort of, you know, the really revealed a problem of financial literacy and negotiation, where some people were like, is this sponsor screwing me over? And mm-hmm. pretty much every time someone asked that, the answer was yes, the sponsor is screwing you over. If you have that doubt, then you know that's, there's probably a good reason why you have that doubt. And then yeah. on the other end of the spectrum, you know, we had these adult pans, world champions, mostly at the m- middle range, so purple, brown belts. And you know, the comments were like, "So I teach 20 classes a week." And I lock up every day and I clean the mats every day. I get free training, but I don't get paid anything. Is this okay? (laughs) I hate this. I mean, (laughs) can you imagine this in any other type of... Well, actually, I can imagine this in other types of businesses because there are lawsuits that happen when this happens. You can't pay someone in favors like that, right? I mean... I don't care if you're a blue belt that's only been training for a year and a half. If you are providing services to the gym, like instruction and you're cleaning and you're doing their admin, you should be getting paid for it, right? I mean, maybe you're not getting paid a ton, but you should at least be getting paid like it's a real job. Yeah. And I think, you know, that was just something that I don't know how much more clearly we can say this, but we really need to say this. People need to be fairly paid. People need Mm -hmm. to know what the minimum wage is and make sure that the exchange of services is at least over and above that. Um, I think there were actually some really promising moments in that where some of the blue belts were actually demanding a pretty good wage and were charging a lot for the privates. But it was especially the people who, you know, what I would classify as full-time competitors with the ability to actually become world-class black belt world champions they were the people who were perhaps most getting taken advantage of because they really just don't care about making money at this point they just want to focus on training and i think some gyms really understand that and may you take advantage of them for it yeah i think that sponsorship is something that's worth talking about specifically because sponsorship in the jujitsu space as a whole is really disappointing most sponsors out there are tiny little fly-by-night businesses that probably don't even want to pay you if you can avoid it, right? A lot of sponsorships come down to, we'll give you free geese and free supplements, but in exchange, you have to promote us every chance you get. We have had, in case people wonder, I mean, I always get people asking me, like, why, why don't you take advertisements or sponsorships on the podcast? It's not that I'm against it. It's that my experience with sponsors in this space has been that they are absolutely not good to deal with. They they want a lot and they don't want to compensate anything, if at all. There is a I mean, we've been approached by 
major players in the space, and I won't name them, who basically the offer on the table was so one sided that it was laughable. And I was I mean, but I know that a lot of other people, if they were approached by that, they would have been so flattered to be associated by a big company like that, that they probably would have done it. But there have been companies that are like, I'm sure the people listening are aware of these companies that have approached us and they wanted to basically like take over the podcast and have us sponsor everything they do and not pay us a dime. And that's very common in jujitsu. And I don't even think you can really call it a sponsorship if there's not adequate compensation behind it, right? If you're doing a job and the way that you monetize that job is you collect sponsorships, then you need to make your sponsors actually pay you a livable wage. If they're not paying you a livable wage, if it's just a few bucks here and there, then you need to seriously rethink your financial situation, unfortunately. And I think all of that absolutely hits the point. And I think a lot of it goes to the, you know, what is your sense of self-worth? And I think what I am trying to do in this survey um, is to give people a really concrete idea of how much they, as a purple belt or a brown belt, how much are you worth? You know, how much should your privates be worth? How much are your classes worth? And to so that they can negotiate with the sponsors and other people in their lives on this basis. And I think it's sponsorship is really interesting. And this part was really clear from the survey where actually your accomplishments, your competition wins, um, your belt rank didn't even matter that much. Yep. How much you got sponsored was actually much more about hustle and how much were you willing to negotiate and push back on the sponsor. So I think it might be helpful for us to just talk a little bit about negotiation. Like what does negotiation mean and like how much should you be able to negotiate with anyone? I would love to dig into that, especially given your perspective. Why don't you just go for it? Like yeah. just take the wheel here and tell me, teach me negotiation from your perspective because I'd love to learn. Okay, so... Just assume that no one ever wants to give you anything, right? And so on that basis, you need to try and create an environment which is most optimal for you to get whatever you need to get. So let's assume that I want to get a gi sponsorship. In order to get the best gi sponsorship, I should talk to every single gi sponsor out there, get as many offers as possible, and then use these offers against each other to get an even better offer. And after I've then gone back to each sponsor several times, I'm hopefully left with a number of offers that I can choose to pick from. And I think instead what people do is they receive one sponsor offer and then they just sign it because they're so flattered and excited that they don't know what they are worth. And I can pretty much guarantee for everyone that ever listened to this, you are always worth more than your first offer. And if you have more than one offer on the table, you're going to get a lot more from it. And I would yeah. say that's a really simple way to kind of look at everything. I think especially with you know apparel sponsors, where athletes are the people who are driving the vast majority of their sales, there are a number of smaller brands now that are really pushing you know the way forwards for affiliate income and i think that is a really beautiful way forwards if a brand can't afford to pay an athlete a cash sponsorship and so it's pretty simple you can just give you know an athlete a code and then they can get a certain percentage say 10% of all the apparel they sell and that really aligns incentives in terms of you know them also promoting you and you get to give them you know some money back but i i'm really really against any sponsorship where the athlete is not getting any money whatsoever. And money here, I would also include registration fees, travel or lodging stipends. And I think this is all, these are all areas where the sponsors should be, you know, really pushed to contribute to because this is essentially, you know, these are the athletes who are wearing your gear and promoting you at these events and they need to be able to go to these events. Right, right. I have a question for you. What about the people who are not ace competitors? Because there's a lot of people out there who love jujitsu and maybe they want to make it their full time job, but they just don't have the competition track record, either because they're not interested in competition or it just never panned out. Or maybe the t- just due to the timing in their life of when they found jujitsu, they just missed the window. If you don't have that resume to sit on top of, How do you go about monetizing what you do have? 
So I would say that 99.9% of people actually belong in this bucket. And maybe they think they belong in the first bucket, which is world-class competitors. And that's just not true. But this is actually a great bucket to be in. But we just have to be really realistic about what this person's skill set is. And so I think in this bucket, you have a couple of different options. One is you can be a full-time teacher. The second one is you can start your own gym. And those are actually very separate things in my head. And the third one is you can pursue a career that, you know, has very flexible working hours, which allows you to pursue jujitsu in a more full-time way. But the first one I think is really interesting because not a lot of people actually do it, which is to be a full-time teacher. So I think there's a real misconception that you have to own a gym in order to make a good living in jujitsu. Whereas actually, I think you can make a great living in jujitsu just by being a great teacher, but you have to really focus on being a great jujitsu teacher with very personalized coaching and be a great concierge style teacher, uh, which is you know where your teaching is really, really geared to each of your students. And I think the way to look at this is to see the group classes that you teach as sort of as a sales funnel to push people into recurring private lessons. And I think this works particularly well at gyms where privates are really normalized into the school as part of the onboarding process and where many students are taking privates consistently and regularly. And this actually happens in many schools. It just depends more on the sort of school's culture. And what's important to note here is you're not pushing people into privates if they don't want to have privates. But there's actually a lot more demand for privates than we know we think. So the personal training industry is a really good example of this, where at some gyms like, say, Equinox, you know, almost everyone does personal training to a certain extent. And at other gyms, that's just not really the case at all. And so it depends on what the setup at schools is. But definitely in the survey, there are people earning over 100K a year just through, you know, recurring privates. Yeah. Privates are a great thing to discuss here when it comes to pricing and valuation. And I love discussing valuation because (laughs) it's a question that everyone always wants to know the answer to. What is this worth? How much should I charge? But no one ever wants to be the person to come out and say it's worth this much. And so I would ask you, and I understand, of course, there's a lot of variables that go into deciding this and there is no one size fits all answer, but how do you go about deciding what is fair? So, I mean, if you're a purple belt or a brown belt and you want to start offering privates, like you said, there's massive pressure for you to feel like you should just lowball it because you're kind of desperate and you just don't think you're worth it and you don't have a, a track record. But how does one go about figuring out, okay, what is the rate that I should charge? I think that's a really interesting question. I think the only thing that matters here is that you believe you're getting a number that you are worth. So if at the end of the day, you know, you've taught the private and you can go home and you were like, okay, I feel really good about that. That's the important part. And there's actually a lot of cases in the survey where people um, have a full time job where they're earning quite a lot of money, you know, 100K plus a year. And on the side, they're teaching jujitsu for a much lower amount, but they really, really enjoy it. And so you know, the money doesn't really matter to them. And so at that point, you can see that the pricing there just has to kind of feel good. If you are someone who, you know, your mindset is more, this is my life's work and, you know, this money needs to be reflective of that, then you should charge accordingly. Like you should not lowball yourself because you'll just feel dirty with yourself afterwards. And that's just not a good feeling. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, maybe offering a slight discount will allow the student to convert into a more regular private. So I think there should be room on that basis. So you can figure out that the most important thing here is about what is the lifetime value for this one particular student. And we should be trying to get everyone into regular recurring privates rather than just a one-off private. And I think for you know these full-time jujitsu teachers and I think you can be a really great jujitsu teacher without being a great competitor, right? And the truth is often, you know, your students have no idea what being a brown belt adult world champion means versus like a 
masters to you know bronze medalist at pans like those things mean nothing to them they just think of you as oh that's my awesome jujitsu teacher and they evaluate you on what they're learning so as long as you're delivering a really great experience to your student and it feels personalized and it's you know really helping their learning that is the most important thing that you know you're you're getting like a five out of five customer service rating and so I think here, like what's really important is that, you know, these full-time jujitsu teachers are punctual, that they have great follow-up. You know, maybe they are following up with YouTube videos or other thoughts of things that, you know, the student can add to their game. And I think what's really interesting in this model is that there are so many, you know, new business models in jujitsu that can happen, which I think have really, you know, we've only really begun to barely explored. There's a company that I got to know recently, like through the survey called Apex Grappling. It's based in San Francisco and it's entirely just, you know, private training in people's homes. And Margot and I actually set this up for two of my friends who were unable to go to jujitsu gyms because they had young kids or they were too busy. And we found them, you know, jujitsu teachers who could go to their home and train them like three to five times a week. And if you think about that, on a monetary level right like that basically would cover someone who needs to train like full-time like that covers someone's you know salary almost entirely so there are definitely people out there who have the financial capacity and for this type of training and you know no desire to go to jujitsu gyms and so there's a lot of innovation of these business models that i think can still happen but we need to look outside of this lens where you know it's like we are a jiu-jitsu gym and there are only group classes and we only have a certain amount of privates. But let's explore all the other ways that we can provide jiu-jitsu to people depending on what they want and what they're willing to pay for. That's a great point because I think that a lot of jiu-jitsu career pathing discussions kind of follow along conventional wisdom, this conventional idea of, well, I'll just become a competitor and rack up a bunch of medals. And then after I can't compete anymore, I'll open a gym. And everyone just kind of tries to go down that road without even thinking about it. But I agree with you completely that there are a ton of potential options to innovate within the space that people aren't even thinking of. I mean, I know, for example, the idea of doing things virtually. I've been in the sport long enough to remember when that was a laughable concept and people literally laughed at people for trying to teach jujitsu online. Whereas I would say that now learning jujitsu online and building virtual relationships with coaches and experts around the world, that's one of the most important things. If you want to really learn this stuff at a deep conceptual level, you can learn a lot of jujitsu virtually. And in fact, in a lot of ways, you can learn things virtually that you could really not realistically learn in person. That's not to say that you're going to get a jujitsu black belt if you only do Zoom classes. But that said, there are ways to impart and exchange information remotely and virtually virtually that are just way more efficient than doing it in a room full of people locally. So I think that the ability to learn virtually is a, a really untouched aspect of the sport. And I think that one of the other things about jujitsu is I've got a, a friend, uh, Alex Samoez. He's, I think, close to getting his black belt. He's the founder of Technique, which is actually a really cool uh, virtual coaching tool that we use on our premium service. And one of my favorite quotes from him is, he's, and this is true, is that jujitsu is really one of the only sports where you can meet your heroes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go to pretty much any other sport, and if you want to meet the people at the very top, you'll never get in touch with them. But with jujitsu... You know, if you want to talk to and connect with and even hire some of the best in the world, I guarantee you that you can do that. <laughs> you know, I guarantee you that you could buzz up Lachlan Giles or Livia Giles or whoever you want. And for a reasonable price, you could probably get some service out of them. And even if you just want to ask them a question, in most cases, they're just happy that people want to talk to them, right? The, the tip top people in our sport are tremendously accessible. And I've found as I've been building up this business that we do here, that what I need to do now is I need to rely on experts in the community to help create content for us. And the easiest way to do that is just fucking pay them. If for some reason, I, I got two years into this without really realizing I could probably call up some really, really smart people who know a lot more about this stuff than me 
and just pay them to help me make content for the podcast. And it's immediately beneficial to them. It's beneficial to me because it adds credibility. And that's one of the cool things to do about in jujitsu, right? If you want to work with elite level athletes and coaches, you can do that probably for a lot less money than you thought you could because this is still an evolving sport and uh, you do still have access to the tip top people in the sport. So I always suggest people consider loosening the purse strings a bit and trying to pay for value because in jujitsu, you can get a lot for not that much money. Absolutely. And I think, you know, if we take a step back, there's actually kind of two concepts here that are really interesting. One is that, you know, unwillingness of people in jujitsu to kind of pay up for stuff that maybe they assume should be free. And I think that in, you know, many other industries and also as we go into personal finance, right, like there is a certain amount of investment that you have to kind of put into something in order to kind of get better at it. And I think the other one is like, I think in many industries, and especially if you work at larger companies, they do a lot of learning and development with you, which really allows you to kind of focus on who you are, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, how do you best learn? And I think, you know, very much so that there is no right way to learn in jujitsu. I think some people learn better in groups, some people learn better in privates. I'm actually a very visual learner. So sometimes actually, you know, instead of actually training for competition, I'll just watch who's number one. And I think, honestly, it's just as effective. But, you know, you have to really understand, like, how do you best learn? What works the most you know, what makes the most sense for you and then kind of tailor your learning on that basis. And I think this especially goes for those of us who are a little bit older, but really want to, I always call it the uh, hour for hour, you know, rather than pound for pound ratio. So instead of, you know, who is the most effective pound for pound grappler, but given a certain number of hours, who is the most effective, you know, grappler in terms of what you've learned. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's so important to understand, too, because there is a perception in the space that unless you are absolutely in the top 1% of jiu-jitsu athletes, you have no business teaching. I see this a lot, and it's kind of weird, honestly, where people will only listen to someone if they're absolutely the tippy top, and they will discredit anyone who has not <laughs> succeeded at that level, which is ridiculous. I mean, some of the best teachers I've ever had are were not ace competitors and in fact we were talking earlier about how to succeed in the business if you're not a competitor i mean i would argue that some of the best coaches i know and some of the most innovative minds that i've ever met are not ace competitors i mean john danaher is the go-to example rob bernacki of really wasn't competing that much at all until he got to like 45 years old and then decided to do it or something like that. Preet Nicholson is a, has an incredible mind for the sport, but he is not a competitor at all. I mean, he's just, he loves jujitsu and he just kind of looks at it like a research project. And there are a lot of opportunities to kind of grow and learn and establish a niche that sets you up as being different from the others. And I think that that's important. You don't have to necessarily be the winningest grappler. You just have to be to have a unique value add and and a unique offering that people want that they can't get elsewhere. And that's part of where that pound for pound versus hour for hour thing comes up. If you can take someone and make them an amazing grappler in a fraction of the time that it took other people, then you have value. And I would argue that the way that we teach jujitsu is generally not very efficient. I mean, we This is a sport where we brag about how long it takes people to get a black belt. But you know what? <laughs> if someone could come around and demonstrate that they could produce an equivalent quality athlete in a quarter of the time, we should be celebrating that in my mind. We should not be bragging that a black belt takes most people over a decade. I mean, if you were a university and you bragged that it took a decade for your students to get a bachelor's degree, you would go out of business because every other university is way more efficient and can do what you do in four years instead of 10. And I think in jujitsu, there is room for a lot of breakthroughs in terms of education and innovation, because if we can ever get to that point where we can teach people more efficiently, you can absolutely monetize that. And we see people in the space doing that already. And I think, you know, what you do here on BJJ Mental Models, you know, it really leans into that, right? Like where you are giving exposure to a lot of these people who have been able to kind of bypass uh, all of these, you know, belt ranks and to be able to kind of figure out how do I catalyze my learning? I think there's also something interesting you said here where there's a misconception, not only that the best grapplers and the best athletes are the best teachers, but I think the reason why we pay these top competitors 
to go to their seminars is not because they're the best teachers. Mostly what we pay for is because we're their fans. We like them and therefore we want to go to their seminars. It's not because they're the best teachers. And I think people need to like really kind of differentiate those things. Like, why am I paying to go to this guy's seminar? It's really not because he's the best. You know, it's mostly because I want to get a photo of him for my Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you from my experience doing this. I mean, when we started this podcast for the longest time, for the first 100 episodes, we really avoided having guests. And it was around episode 90 that we started pivoting and we started bringing on guests. I really wanted the show to have a cohesive identity. And I was worried that if I had like a rotating panel of guests, I wouldn't be able to do that. Although I think that's been proven wrong. I think we've been able to demonstrate we can do that. And what I have found in this process is that celebrity is not the best indicator of value. I assumed out of the gate that if I could just get the biggest and most famous names on this podcast, it would be a game changer for us. But that has not been my experience at all. I remember we had, if you remember about a year or so ago, there was that big debacle where Gordon and Lachlan were going back and forth on social media about PED use in the sport. And like the day after that happened, I got Lachlan on the phone and I was able to get him to do an interview with us to basically respond and talk about his opinions on the PED stuff. And I thought that was going to be a watershed moment for this podcast. I thought that was going to be like, that's going to be the thing that makes us hockey stick. But if I go back and look at the analytics, that actually wasn't our most popular episode by far. And in fact, the celebrity of the guest is not really an indicator at all in terms of how popular the episode will be. And the formula that I've kind of landed on is what I look for when I make one of these episodes. People always ask like, hey, can I come on the podcast? I want to talk about X, Y, Z. Look, the thing that I look for if someone wants to come on the show, I want three things out of them. And I don't give a shit about their celebrity status. Number one, I want a unique, novel, interesting, valuable topic. Number two, I want a guest that is uniquely qualified and passionate to discuss that topic. And number three, I want it to be a topic that hasn't been done to death a hundred times already, right? So the challenge with getting someone like Danaher on the podcast is I can't really conceivably think of anything I would ask him that he hasn't already answered better a hundred times elsewhere. So what I have found is bringing in people with really unique perspectives who maybe are not the most famous or alternately bringing in people who have expertise in a totally unrelated space and bringing them in and then showing how that can cross connect to jujitsu. That has been the stuff for us that has moved the needle more than any celebrity chasing. And I think that that's illustrative of the fact that a lot of the time, the most famous coach is not going to be the best coach. So just because you're not John Danaher, that doesn't mean that you can't teach jujitsu and be very successful, right? You can still find a niche. You just have to be very thoughtful about how you do it. I think that is very true. I'd love to push back on you on this in that I think there's a lot of self-selection here, right? And I think, you know, you have a very discerning audience who are smart enough maybe, you know, to see past the non-celebrity status of these guests. But if you did have John Danaher on here, I imagine he'd also bring a lot of his groupies over. So is this about, you know, engagement of your retained audience or is this about growth of this podcast? Like, do you want the Danaher groupies? But what I'm saying is when we've had those big guests on the podcast, if I look at the analytics, it didn't even really move the needle tremendously. In a lot of cases, it may not have even provided a temporary spike in viewership, not like I would have expected. And I think the reason why is because from my experience, it is better to have a guest or an influencer on who is deeply invested in promoting their appearance versus having like an A-lister who is willing to just come on and shoot the shit for an hour, but ultimately they're not really invested in the success of the show. So I would, for example, rather have someone with a smaller following on the podcast, but who's really flattered that they had that opportunity and they're really honored to be here and they want to be buddies with me and they want to collab in the future and they want to cross promote. That's more valuable than busting my ass to get like some celebrity on here who will come on for an hour, but ultimately just doesn't have the time to really establish a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. At least for me, I found that the former is more valuable than the latter. Again, like your mileage may vary. Everyone may have a different experience depending on what they're trying to sell. But for me, I've found that influencer fame only goes so far if the person is not really invested in the collaboration. 
I think that's very fair. And I think there's also, you know, similar to another point on the compensation survey where I asked people about engagement. And I think people don't really care about engagement unless you're very invested in your social media. But when I look at people's social media profiles, I don't really care about how much followers you have. Um, I care much more about how are people engaged on, you know, each of your posts. Do people really comment? You know, are they liking it? What are they saying? And I think that's much more indicative of how are people responding to you as an athlete or as a person or as a teacher. And also, you know, at my company, that's how we evaluate how we would work with any micro influencer or influencer. I think on the other point about, you know, how can you level up with a coach in the quickest way? That was partially what drew me to Margot. And I found her initially because I was looking for a female coach who could work with me as I traveled a lot. And initially I was based at New York um, at a non-unity gym, but I was traveling to London a lot and I needed someone who could essentially, you know, help me look over my jujitsu as I was in different places and training across different gyms. And I found Margot and I think what really impressed me was that she had gotten to such a high standard of jujitsu, even though, you know, most of her formative years had been in Hong Kong, which, you know, there is just not a lot of great jujitsu there. And I think it's a very different thing, you know, to develop to be a top world-class athlete in California or New York then you know whereas now like I think there are world-class athletes really coming out of everywhere and that's a very different thing yeah yeah I I think that watching the evolution of the sport is fascinating and you're you're right that it is possible to be actually surprisingly good at jujitsu, even if you don't have that infrastructure around you. I've, I've certainly seen it happen. I mean, I've trained with people in very remote areas of the world who don't even have a local coach, and they were way better than I would have expected for someone who was not directly under a black belt at the time. So you can definitely do it. But yeah, I think, again, one of the cool things about where we live in today, especially after the pandemic, where so much of what we used to do in person is now moved over to Zoom. I think there is a, a much greater appetite for coaching remotely because you can still, even if you have a full-time local coach who oversees your day-to-day -day training, you can still have fractional aspects of coaching from just people all over the world. I mean, sometimes if I'm working on something very specific and my coach just maybe I think, ah, they're just not the right person to really help with this particular thing. I will just seek out the person online who maybe is, and I'll just send them some rolling footage or ask them some questions and establish a business relationship with them. And again, usually for a very reasonable fee, you can get a lot of value out of that. And I think a lot of coaches would probably actually be surprised at how successful they could be offering these kinds of services online if they tried. Absolutely. There was a really interesting comment when we first put out the compensation survey, and uh, it was a pretty negative comment, at least that's how I perceived it. And this guy said, my guess is jujitsu is made up of 90% self-aware hobbyists, 8% delusional hobbyists who think they aren't, and maybe 2% of what I would call professional. And he goes on to talk about how training full-time does not make you a professional, and that you know so much of you know these people in jujitsu are also rands and that it was a harsh truth for many people to swallow. And I think that what people, you know, the part that's missing for a lot of people isn't necessarily the technique. I think a lot of the technique and, you know, the fractional training and all the coaching is actually available there. A lot of it is really about the confidence and belief. And that mm -hmm. seems to be still a part that's much easier to impart while you're, when you're training with someone else who's also world champion, right? Like you could know yeah. what your level is versus them. And I think what felt really clear to me from this guy's comment was that maybe he just doesn't train with, you know, people who have been world champion because what he doesn't see is the struggle that so many of these, you know, young competitors go through where they are training at the very, very top level and they just honestly can't make any money. And I think that was something that was really shocking to me that this kind of view would actually come from a gym owner. I can kind of see it, though, actually, and I'll tell you why. I mean, and I know I'm not the only one. I know Travis Stevens, for example, has talked frequently about this exact thing. And this is kind of one of those, like, if a tree falls in a forest mental exercises. But it's a fair question, which is, if you are doing jujitsu full time, but you're not actually able to pay the bills off of it, can you still call yourself a professional? 
I mean, because yes, part of being a professional is acting like a professional, which means, you know, operating as a professional, training as a professional, dieting as a professional. There's a lot of aspects to Mm -hmm. that versus being a hobbyist. But if you're not actually paying your bills on the sport, are you a professional? And that I suspect, I mean, granted, I, I don't know this conversation, so I might be misreading it, but that I suspect is probably where he's coming from. And in that situation, this person would be right. There are a lot of people who bust their asses in jujitsu and technically they do everything right from a performance standpoint, but they just don't make any money off of it. And I think it's fair to ask and say, well, look, can you really call yourself a professional if this is not how you're feeding your family? And I think that illustrates the gap in value versus compensation in jujitsu that we see. There's a lot of people who are technically doing everything right, but they're just not making the money, at least doing everything right from a technique standpoint. I mean, if you're a plumber and you're going to everyone's houses <laughs> and you're unplugging their toilets and you're the best plumber in the city, but no one is actually paying you for it, are you a professional, right? I, I think that's a fair question to ask. No, absolutely. And I would say my response to that would be, what is the word after the word professional? Are you jujitsu professional competitor or are you jujitsu professional teacher or are you jujitsu professional right. gym owner? And I think, you know, the difference in what I would love to push people to really consider is which of these buckets do you really belong in? And a lot of people are more like halfway in one bucket and halfway in the other. And I think if people just focused on really becoming a full-time jujitsu professional teacher, then they would actually get to the numbers that they're looking for. And yeah. I think, you know, because sometimes in in many gyms we haven't normalized privates and people are are, you know trying to kind of ask their teachers for like essentially free privates after class Mm -hmm. that is why our industry you know could just become a little bit more professional and help a lot more people be able to earn Mm -hmm. a full-time salary while not being a professional competitor Right, right. Can I ask you a question on on the topic of privates? Because you're right, like privates are one of the quickest and easiest ways for an accomplished grappler to make some money in the sport. I would venture to guess, though, and I'd be curious to know if you agree with the statement, but I would venture to guess that, look, if you're listening to this podcast and you have a number in your head of what you would normally charge for a private, my guess is you could double that number and there's a good chance you're probably still undervalued, at least from what I've seen in terms of talking to a lot of people out there. I'd be curious to know if you feel the same way. I So I would say in general, yes. But because I started my jujitsu in New York at a gym, I would say that was very friendly <laughs> and not super competitive. I think this gym that I started jujitsu at was probably the best example of people making really solid income from privates that I've seen anywhere in jujitsu. And I don't think anyone at the gym competed, but you know, it was just like a standard thing that all the students at the gym took like one to two to even three privates a week with someone. And I thought that was very interesting. But you know, what I would ask people is this is, you know, play around with your pricing, like talk to your people. The worst that can happen is someone says no to you, right? And if you've told them a number that you think you're worth and they said no, that is fine. That just means that, you know, the supply and the demand did not match. And then we move on. You know, it's like being rejected for a date. It doesn't really matter. There's plenty of fish in the sea. And, you know, this number also is not your self-worth, right? Like so you are not this number, but it should be a number that makes you kind of feel good. And if you believe you're worth more than that, then you should charge more than that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, The whole psychology of this is interesting. And I feel the desire that a lot of people have, you know, especially when you're getting started, you probably have doubts about what you're worth. You probably can't imagine why anyone would pay you. And I know that people is out of the gate have a tendency to lowball themselves. And the thinking here is often, well, I'm desperate. Maybe I need the money or maybe I'll start low just to get some customers and then I'll raise my prices later. And I understand that. But my my preferred advice in most situations, unless you absolutely desperately need the money, I usually suggest to people not to lowball yourself because starting low, it puts you in a stratosphere of customers who are cheap. 
And if you're going after cheapskates as your customers, then not only are you devaluing yourself now, but you're creating a knock-on effect where you're basically building up a, a customer base of other cheap people. And it is always harder to do business with cheap people than with people who are actually willing to pay a fair value. If you are doing business with cheap people, you're going to be spending all your time trying to claw sing- like dollars and pennies out of them. Whereas it is far better to establish relationships with people who see that value in you versus people who try to devalue you for their own personal gain. And I'd also like to add here that, you know, you're not, it's not a zero sum game. You're not depriving these people of money. Often people want to pay you and often people don't really mind paying you more. I think, you know, people often think that, oh my gosh, if I charge someone more that, you know, they must think I'm a bad person. But it's not a bad for you to earn money. And often the other person might not even mind that paying you more. If they mind that they're paying you that sum of money, they will just not pay it. And that is okay. There's also this kind of idea that, you know, I can only raise my prices once I get a new belt. And that's not true. You can raise your prices whenever you like. Um, yeah. So <laughs> you, you go crazy with it. Like you're actually self employed, you can do whatever you want. One person can be charged a different number to the other person. If you don't like someone, you can just give them a crazy number. They can just say no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. And I like the idea of experimenting with your pricing because something, I mean, something I have learned over the years is that at different pricing tiers, you attract customers with different psychology. I mean, when we started this podcast, the intent was never to monetize originally. The intent was to share information. But when the pandemic happened, you know, it, times were risky and very, very uncertain. And, you know, talked to my brother and we decided, you know what? This is, if we're ever going to actually figure out how to try to monetize this thing, we should start right now. And I was really blown away out of the gate by the number of people who actually were willing to pay when 99% of what we do, we give away for free, but yet here we are, it, it worked. What I have found though, over the time is if you ask people for a little bit of money, you basically wind up dealing with people who they just don't, might not have the disposable income to really afford it. So it's a really stretch for them or the psychology might be different rather that, you know, if, if people are only giving you one or $2 rather than thinking of actually buying something, what they're thinking of is that they're kind of giving you a tip or doing you a favor. And this is kind of the challenge I have with systems like Patreon, for example, we were originally Patreon funded. But what I found is when you're on a Patreon platform, you are collecting people and customers who have the psychology of patronage. No matter how much value you give them, they think they're doing you a favor, right? I could be giving them hours and hours and hours of my time every month, but if they might be paying me like five bucks a month and think that they're doing me a real solid when actually I'm ripping myself off. So we've changed that model quite a bit. And I found actually by increasing our prices, that allows me not just to collect better customers who really understand what they're paying for and really see the value in it, but it also allows me then to fund better content because there's more money coming in. So playing around with pricing is more important because it's it's not just a matter of finding the magic number that people will agree to, but it also allows you to open up different tiers and different classes of product and different types of customers that you might not otherwise have thought you could attract. Steve, what is your aim? What is my aim? Yes. With the podcast? Yeah. Like, are you aiming to, you know, like, is this about profit maximization? Like, you know, what is the aim? The podcast is not my full-time job. It's, I mean, it's a hobby that kind of grew into this mega project that now is its own thing. I mean, it, it does well enough that if push came to shove, I could probably live off of it like right now, but at the rate that it's growing, my strategy at the moment is to basically invest every dollar back into content. So normally this means working with and collaborating with pros to increase production quality, to increase output, to get on better experts. In terms of what I want out of the podcast, my goal is to build one of, if not the best platform in the space for jujitsu education. That's really what I'm looking to do. And I'm looking to continue to give most of it away for free because like what you said, 
I think that really the watershed moment for jujitsu was when options like online content started to come up because it busted a lot of the myths about jujitsu. It shattered a lot of the gym secrecy bullshit we used to have to deal with. And I want our platform to be a leading space on that. So that's my goal. Mm -hmm. My goal with BJJ Mental Models is not financial, although, of course, I it needs to break even and it needs to make enough money to justify my personal investment in it. I would love for this thing to be to the point where it's making enough money that basically it can fund my family in retirement. But that said, at the end of the day, the goal is not profit. The goal is education and providing a platform to build other educators. That's really what I want to do out of this thing. That's beautiful. But I I think that's a really important question that everyone should ask themselves, right? Like, which is, what is the actual aim here? Like, why are you teaching these privates? Like, what are we working towards? And, you know, if the aim here is, you know, let's play around with the pricing models that we can, you know, fund more revenue, which we can then, you know, reinvest back into for education, that feels very clear. If this is just about, you know, earning as much income as, you know, you want every year, then maybe you want to lower your pricing a little bit in order to kind of get more privates. In many cases, actually, I think people actually would be better off raising their prices quite a bit and just doing fewer privates, which actually leaves them a lot more time to, you know, focus on training. And I think that's yes. particularly, you know, why instructionals are so important because they're forms of passive income. It's why seminars are so important for competitors because you can teach so many more people in one go. But the moment that, you know, competitors spend too much time on teaching, it really saps them away from training time, which then, you know, leads them into being much worse competitors, which is sort of like the opposite of what we're trying to go for. So I think being really clear about what are you trying to earn and what is your main goal here? That is very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's also important to make sure that people understand your goals do not have to always be altruistic. It is okay to say, I want to make money. I mean, I'll be completely honest. Of course, if this podcast were not making money, I'm not sure I would have stuck through for as long as I have. I'm not sure I would be as passionate about growing it. But at the end of the day, there are people who fund this thing. And because of that, I am invested in making them successful as well. So I think that the problem is people often think that passion and compensation are mutually exclusive and that if you're really passionate about something, you shouldn't be asking for money. I've even had people who listen to the podcast flat out tell me that they will never pay me out of principle because they believe that I should be doing this for free, to which I say, fuck you to those people. But also, I mean, those are not the, the people that I'm trying to target, right? At the end of the day, if someone is not invested in helping me be successful, my ability to help them be successful is much more limited. I mean, they still have the free podcast, but the best stuff that we make is pay gated. And I simply, because a lot of the best stuff that we do requires me to invest personal time in relationships with people, I simply cannot scale that out to the tens of thousands of people who would otherwise listen to this thing. So you can have the free stuff and I'm glad you're getting value out of it. But like you said, some things can be considered passive income where they scale up. But that is one of the risks of getting into privates, right? Is you are basically selling off blocks of your time and your ability to scale that is hard. So that's why it's so important to price your privates effectively. Because if you lowball and you fill your calendar up with eight hours a day of privates, that's great. But that means that you can't use any of that time to actually build something for yourself and to build things that might make income passively in the background. I mean, I, I think it's better personally if you up your rates and get fewer privates, but then you can use that extra time to build assets, to build products that can make money in the background while you're doing other things like privates. So I always encourage people to think about that when they decide on their pricing. Yeah, I, I think that's very important. I think the survey was also pretty clear in showing that uh, unless the person had a full-time job somewhere else and was just seriously training jujitsu on the side, most people did not hold any serious assets. So ETFs, mm -hmm. brokerage funds, IRAs, etc. And you know, for me to read that was, you know, a little bit scary. It really shows how essentially we are bringing up all of these athletes in jiu-jitsu who are going to hit a certain point where they're probably going to get injured, where they don't have any semblance of a retirement. And I think that's very sad. I, I agree completely. I think that we we fail to set people up financially in the sport because we have to bear in mind a lot of traditional jobs you can do until you're, you know, 65 years old. No problem unless something catastrophic happens. But if you're a jujitsu athlete, you've only got so many years of activity 
And so whatever you're doing during that time has to be an investment to what comes after. Um, we had Elliot Marshall on the podcast who talked quite extensively about this and how you pivot from, okay, I am a competitor to my competitive days are over. How am I going to continue to take the skills that I did have and to transition them into something I can still do and still help people with, even if I'm too old to compete now? And I think that's a, a really interesting thing that people need to understand is you can take the skills you develop on the competitive scene and you can repackage and sell those in a different way. Just rather than you yourself going onto the mats and trying to win, maybe perhaps you are providing coaching services, mindset information, you're helping people with nutrition, you're starting a gym. There's so many other ways that you can transition that skill set so that you can still make it useful after your competitive days. We just don't talk about that enough. Yeah. And I, I think ultimately, you know, the people who thrive when they are, you know, younger as either athletes or other professionals, right? If they are successful as a competitor, that means they're probably doing a really solid job at marketing, at networking with other gyms and things like that. If they're successful as a teacher, it probably means that, you know, they're great at customer service, at marketing, at sales. And if they've managed to, you know, make a gym operate really well, then that success probably came to also, you know, sales and marketing, customer service. But really thriving financially in jiu-jitsu requires a whole host of business skills. And so I think, you know, a lot of the programs like uh, AOJ's Belief and Achieve program, they really push these athletes to try and develop these business skills at a young age. And that is like the fundamental part that's missing with a lot of, you know, these younger athletes. And I think more gyms to, should try and nurture that as part of, you know, that program rather than just pushing people to do pro training every day. Yeah, absolutely. Now, something we didn't really get into, although we talked about it, I'd love to actually clarify and expand on this. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning that when you're not training, you're a tech and fashion entrepreneur. What exactly does that mean? What do, what do you do and what does your company look like? Yeah, sure. So my company is called A-Day, A-D-A-Y. We are a direct consumer brand. So we used to have a couple of storefronts actually, but then COVID happened and we had to shut them down. But we make sustainable apparel. So about 90% of our apparel is you know, made using recycled fabrics, natural fabrics, and we make incredibly versatile women's wear. And so we are venture funded, um, which means that these investors give us money in with the expectation that we will make them a decent size return someday. So we have raised around $15 million in venture funding. I think we have around 30 employees worldwide. Uh, we have an office in London and also a number of people across the US. But what my day really looks like is I type on the computer a lot and I have a lot of conference calls, I guess. <laughs> but I'm very involved with marketing. I'm very involved with, you know, business and growth. And ultimately, I think what I'm really passionate about is um, how can we tell stories and how can we, you know, bring the most interesting stories to as many people as possible. And for me, like, what is very clear is that, you know, the jujitsu community of which I would say the most discerning and some of the most, you know, willing to spend on income exists here at BJJ Mentor Models. But the yeah. jujitsu community is just not is not interesting enough for me in terms of people who actually want to spend on stuff. Like I would hate to try and monetize this as a community. And so every time I'm coming up with, you know, one of these surveys or other things I'm interested in. I don't have any expectation that I would ever get paid for anything, but nor would I want to. I think that would be an incredibly unfulfilling thing. And so I think it's a very hard task for a lot of these athletes and full-time people to be able to kind of find the people within jujitsu to monetize kind of correctly. Whereas, you know, when I look at my company, right, an average order for us is almost $300. That's a much, much better customer, right? Over the course of one year, um, I know that she's going to spend like almost $600 with us. And so I have an expectation that whenever I acquire one of these customers, I know when we're going to break even with this person. And what does that then look like for the rest of that customer cohort? Awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, let me ask you a question here. I'm going to put you on the spot. Based on your experience and what you know about BJJ Mental Models, if you were to look at what we do here as a business, which it is, what suggestions would you have for me on how to improve both the product and the monetization? Can you tell me a bit more about how you actually monetize? Because I really thought you were a Patreon business, so that was wrong. Well, we we started Patreon before I would really say 
we considered ourselves a business. The first year of this podcast was basically my brother and I, who come from different backgrounds, but we're both black belts. We kind of realized that even though we have very different styles and philosophies about jujitsu, we'd kind of stumbled upon the same conceptual frameworks. And so we built up kind of like a big database of all of the stuff. We put it online and then we decided, you know, it would be helpful is to have a podcast to help explain that. So we did that and it kind of grew and grew and grew and became very established. And then when COVID happened, we decided, okay, well, you know what, just in case something happens, we lose our jobs or whatever, because my brother is a gym owner, right? So of course he's affected by gym closures. We thought, well, we better start trying to see if we can monetize this thing. We set up a Patreon. I was frankly shocked at how many people signed up for it. And that kind of kicked us in the ass. And I realized, okay, well, this is now opening up the ability that now that money is coming in for us to really invest in making this a better product, especially because the bandwidth limitation on this thing is basically my time, right? I have a full-time job. I'm a tech executive at a company here in Vancouver. I can only afford so much time on the podcast and editing this shit takes a long time, as my editor will attest, especially given how picky I am. So one of the first big changes we made was hiring an editor, establishing an advertising budget to actually promote our stuff since so much of it is free making sure that we could get our reach out there. That has since expanded now, and we do paid content collaborators. So a lot of the stuff on our premium series, for example. On the free podcast, of course, most people are happy to be on here just for the exposure. But if I'm paygating content, I'm never going to let someone do that for free for me unless there's some sort of exchange of value, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair to have someone on the pod and have them make it like a five-part series with me, and they get nothing in return. So usually I'm looking to pay those people, or if they really want to barter, then I'll help them. Them do their own thing. But basically, this the money that we brought in allows us to build and expand this and to we've kind of expanded and expanded. And at this point, this thing is more of a production house than it is a podcast. Most of the people who listen to this probably are familiar with just the podcast side of things. But what we do now is we offer BJJ Mental Models Premium, which is our premium service. You join that and you get a bunch of other stuff, right? The podcast is basically there for public consumption, but behind the pay gate, we basically have the best that I could equate it to mm-hmm. is think of like masterclass, but for jujitsu. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in building technique instructionals. I'm interested in deconstructing and picking apart the minds of the smartest and coolest and most interesting people in the sport, right? I don't want to have Emily Kwok teach me how to do an arm bar from guard. I want to unpack her mentality. I want to learn how Emily Kwok was able to study with Marcelo Garcia, Josh Waitzkin, how she won worlds multiple times a black belt, how she built a career as a peak performance coach, how she did all of this while having three kids. That's what I want to know. So that's the kind of stuff that we do on our premium side, in addition to, of course, direct coaching, which I have to pay gate because I simply cannot give that away to everyone for free as much as I would like to. So that's where we're at right now. The podcast has doubled in a viewership and revenue roughly every year. So I, I don't want to give the, the hard numbers out here, but it does well enough that, like I said, if I had to do this as a full-time job, I could make it happen. And I'm confident it would continue to grow at a rate where it would be an okay thing. <laughs> that's basically where we're at. But what I'm trying to figure out now, based on my own limited experience as an entrepreneur, is what's the next step? What should I be targeting? What am I not doing now that I need to do if I want to 2x this by next year, right? Because that's my goal. I would love this to be 2x at minimum in terms of viewership and revenue by the end of next year. And what I'd love to know is how to do that. What am I missing? Cool. And how do you think people usually normally convert? Like, do they listen to the podcast first and then they join Discord and then they subscribe to Premium? I would venture to guess that, and and again, it is hard to track this because one of the downsides of doing a podcast is you have very weak analytics about what the hell people are actually Mm -hmm. doing. But I would venture to guess that people either find the podcast either through word of mouth a lot of the time or because a a guest came on and promoted the podcast and so they followed through that or due to my activity on platforms like Reddit where I'm heavily involved, all of that funnels back. And of course, a lot of attention comes from advertisements that we run and that gets people into the door. Most people will listen to the podcast for a while and then at some point they'll they'll take the plunge and they'll want to convert over to the premium side of things. And that's mm-hmm. basically we pay gate that stuff. So if you want to get into like our Discord and our community, either you have to be pretty damn cool to have me let you in by default or you have to be part of our paid community. And the reason why is because 
I've found that if you pay gate people into the community, they will be on their best behavior. I don't want shitheads in our community. I don't want toxicity. <laughs> and if people are literally investing to be in there, they will act on their best behavior. And that makes the moderation job much easier. So that's kind of the funnel that I see is people will either come in from word of mouth because one of our guests promoted it from Reddit or from advertisements. From there, they'll either listen to the pod or subscribe to our newsletter and probably after in consuming like you know like 10 episodes worth at some point i would expect that they would convert and have you done much like focus groups and talking to your users in terms of like how they convert to premium not as much as i probably should for the people that are on there in terms of why they convert and why they retain, I have a pretty good idea Mm -hmm. of the profile of the person who converts, especially the person who stays, right? Because a lot of people are going to convert, try it for a month, and then say, ah, this isn't what I wanted. But for the people who stay, I have a really good handle on why. What I don't know is for the people out there who haven't converted, they might be outside of the profile of people that I'm targeting, and maybe I could do Mm -hmm. a better job of reaching out to and converting them. That I don't know. And that that is where I haven't done probably sufficient market research. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know how to do that because that's out of my skill set. So I sort of used to do something like this as a full-time job. I was a venture capital investor. And also these days, and I'm happy to say my number, I get paid $1,000 an hour for talking to people on the phone about questions like this. So I'm going to make a bunch of assumptions about BJJ mental models, and you can tell me all the parts I'm wrong. Okay. So it seems like for your people who do subscribe, they're very sticky and they feel very enthusiastic about it. And I know this because Beatrice Jing, who I have met in person, wears a BJJ Mental Models patch on her gi, which makes me think that she likes it a lot. Beatrice and I are like internet besties. She's okay. one of the cool people that I talked about earlier <laughs> that I've never met in person, but I feel like I know her super duper duper well because of our relationship here through the podcast. Shout outs to Beatrice, by the way. Beatrice is awesome. Awesome. So I think your premium product is likely very good. I think the main thing, I wonder if you could even just 2x this in the next month. I literally don't understand what your premium product is from the website at all. That's a good point. And that is somewhat intentional. Okay. And I'll I'll explain the logic here. So this is actually something I struggle with. And I'm you know what? I'm really curious. Side break. I'm really curious to know if <laughs> listeners are going to love or hate this conversation. So do write in and let me know if you want more of this or less. But the reason I'm asking you this, Meg, is because I thought a lot of financial stuff is very hypothetical. And, you know, it sounds good in theory, but people don't know how to apply it. And I thought if I could give you myself as an example, it would give people a real, like actual tangible thing that they could hold on to to understand what the process looks like. But to answer your question, the reason it's not really advertised super heavily on premium is because from my experience, people don't come to our site to sign up for premium. People come to our site because they're looking for our database or they're looking for the podcast. And it is only after that or going through the newsletter that at some point, if if they've gotten, you know, 10, 20 hours of value out of the podcast, at some point people are going to say, I should probably look into this premium thing. So I really don't advertise it much on the website. Mm -hmm. That said, our website needs, I think it needs an evolution. It was built originally to be basically just a database of concepts. That was the scope of this thing. And so I intentionally built something that looked extremely bare bones. I went for like a very Wikipedia-esque look. Unfortunately, the business has evolved a lot since then and the website doesn't reflect that, but it still converts really well. So I'm kind of hesitant to rock the boat because I know it's working. But anyway, sorry, I hope that answers your question. No, I think that was a great answer. So I would challenge you there on your assumption, which is that your assumption is people come in through the podcast and they have to listen to a certain number of hours before they can be interested in premium. What I would suggest here is that the premium content is so good that you should just give everyone the free trial, which you already have, and then just see if they stick with it. I don't think this Mm -hmm. idea that, you know, they have to listen to X amount of audio first necessarily exists. What I see from the website is it looks a lot like it's a Patreon website. Right. Like it looks like mm-hmm. there's a content that, you know, we want to give you high fives for all of that. Like I want to contribute five, ten, however many dollars a month for. It does not look like that you want to funnel people towards the premium, which makes me yeah. think that the Discord group or some other, you know, 
thing at work, which is probably this 20 hours of audio assumption, is pushing people towards that. But what I would love to understand is, you know, I think there are some what I would call baby testimonials. But, you know, frankly, like if I read them, I have no idea what's going on. I'm going to read some of these out loud because it's very funny. I have testimonials on the website. I don't even remember this. (laughs) Like, okay. I love the conceptual approach and how they break things down. Are we talking about like someone making a Rubik's Cube? I don't know. It answers the (laughs) why and elevates how you play the game into a more strategic level rather than tactical. But what you just told me here is like, I want to understand the key difference between how, you know, Emily Kwok managed to raise three kids and become like a multiple black belt world champion, et cetera, et cetera. Those are really tangible things, you know, strategic level rather than tactical conceptual approach. It's just really hard to understand. And I think um, a lot of it, you know, all the information is probably there, but just kind of feeding it to people in a way that really allows them to kind of understand it. And if you don't think you can explain that well, then I would just push people into a free trial ASAP and be like, thank you for coming to my website. Here's a free trial. Go wild. And maybe they're only allowed a free trial for like 48 hours, but allow them to see the best of your content, especially if, you know, they'll make you sticky. So I, I was one of the first 50 employees at an app called Poshmark, which is now a co- public company. Oh, I am well aware of Poshmark. <laughs> every every woman in my life is like side hustling on Poshmark. And I, I, I have to admit, if they had more guy stuff, I would totally use it because it's an awesome product. Anyway, there you go. And what we learned at Poshmark is what you needed to do was after a person signed up on the app, you needed them to get a like and also look at a listing as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you got them to make a listing, they were basically, you know, a customer for life. And a similar thing happened at Facebook, where Facebook back in the old days, they realized that you need to get to a magic number, which I think was nine connections, ASAP, and then you would stick around, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the magic, you know, moment on the BJJ Mental Models app? And I wonder... If it's, you know, they listen to some element of a podcast, but maybe there's something on past the paywall that they need to experience. Like, what is yeah. your most compelling piece of content? I would deliver that, smack them in front of their face, force them to watch it, and then see what happens after that. That's a really good point. And I think your feedback here is touching on a, a hole in my thinking, a blind spot here, which is that. I've been doing this thing for so long now, and I'm so ingrained with my own community that. I have trouble seeing what the product looks like from someone who hasn't seen it before. So as as an example, if you've been listening to the podcast for a significant period of time, when I talk about strategic concepts, for example, and a conceptual approach, you certainly know what I'm talking about. But if you're a first timer and you just came here and you're not super ingrained in the community already... I'm basically speaking a language with those quotes that means nothing to a lay person. So I think I need to rethink that whole thing. And that's really good feedback. Thank you. And I think something else here is, you know, it seems like you have a pretty clear idea of who the existing subscribers are. But I think another assumption we want to test is, are the customer, you know, the premium people you're going to acquire in future, are they all going to be similar types of people to these people? So is it about finding more of them? Or is there like another kind of profile that we haven't vetted out more, but we need to describe our offering in a slightly different way to appeal to them? And you see this on many websites where, you know, if you look at, I don't know, like Brex, which is a credit card, they have different landing pages, which are tailored to different types of customers because they know different people using it for different purposes, right? Like maybe, I think there could be very different, you know, and jujiteros who are using BJJ mental models for very different purposes. Like they probably all have to, you know, like consuming audio, but maybe, you know, on the one hand, this is someone who is very interested in competing you know, very conceptual, intellectual, and maybe someone else just you know, really, you know, needs more help because they're much more remote based and don't have access to a gym and really appreciate the coaching much more. So I yeah. would try to kind of maybe split these end users a little bit more. Yeah, I feel like there's a user persona that I'm missing there. I feel like, I mean, obviously what we're doing right now, it, it's working, but I think to really expedite the growth, I feel like I'm reaching a specific group of people. And within that group, the retention, the conversion, the community aspect works very well. But I feel like there's other people out there who would benefit from this that probably are a totally different persona that I'm not reaching. So I think that's something I'm going to have to dig through the analytics and see if I can understand. If you're a listener and you have feedback on this or no one answer, by the way, just 
fucking write write in and tell me. I would love to get your feedback. I mean, if you've listened through this already, then at this point, you probably have a pretty deep understanding of how this platform works. So I would definitely love any feedback on how to improve. That's something that I'm I'm always very mindful of doing. And specifically, I would love for you to write in and answer what problem is BJJ Mental Models solving for you? Mm-hmm. Like, why are you paying this if it's not just, you know, this concept of, you know, tipping Steve? Like, what problem is it solving for you that you wouldn't be able to get answers to elsewhere? Yeah, awesome. Well, I will work on that. Meg, we've been at this for a while here. Before we tie this up, any closing thoughts or things you wanted to talk about that we didn't yet get to? I was just say maybe an end plea for people, especially the listeners of this podcast. I think there are so many people in jujitsu who have so many great skills and all sorts of things. And this is such a young industry. If we all just pushed a little bit, we could really make this industry thrive and move. But it involves all of us standing up and kind of speaking out loud and actually doing something. And I think we all feel passionately enough about the sport that, you know, we don't mind volunteering a little bit of help. Maybe it's just sharing a post or writing a post. But there are so many aspects of this industry, whether it's about the finances or about, you know, safe training environments and sexual harassment, that we just need to stand up a little bit for. And I would ask, you know, the listeners, you know, to stand up for this. Absolutely. Well, I greatly appreciate this conversation. Thank you so much for coming by. If people want to follow you or check you out or get in contact with you, Meg, how do they go about doing that? I'm on Instagram at meg.he. And then I think you can either DM me on there. That's probably the best way. I think I have a website. Awesome. And I will put that link in the show notes. So if anyone forgets it or doesn't have a pen and paper in front of them, just check the show notes for the podcast and you'll have the link in there. And hey, on that note, if I am looking for sustainable women's fashion, where would I go to do that? Yeah, you can also check out Aday on Instagram. It's just at A-D-A-Y. There you go. Support jujitsu entrepreneurs. Now, I would love to know how long is it going to be before you start making fashion that is inspired by jujitsu stuff? I'm not sure, but Margot and I may have something coming out in the next few months. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> There's your teaser. Awesome. Well, the links will be in the show notes. So I do encourage everyone to, to follow Meg. Like I said, Meg came onto my radar because every cool person I know in jujitsu seems to be following her. And that's kind of my litmus test these days. So you passed the test, Meg. Uh, thank you so much for coming by. This was a fantastic chat. I really appreciate everything that you, you explained here and the knowledge that you shared. It's been very helpful to me. I'm sure it will be very helpful to our listeners. And like you said, I mean, if if at the bare minimum, this encourages people who are looking to do this as a career to think more about the strategy and the financial planning behind things and how they can get to the point where they're profiting and doing well off of the sport, then I think we've achieved our goal. And I'm really glad we had this talk. Thank you so much, Steve. Yeah. And I mean, I know I already talked probably longer than anyone conceivably wants about the premium (laughs) stuff, but if I haven't already hammered that shit home hard enough, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com is where you go to check that out. There is a seven day free trial. I won't go belabor the point here because I've already talked at length about it. But again, that is how we fund the show. Link in the show notes. If you want to check it out, there is a free trial. Thanks again for checking that out. Premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. So with that said, I'll tie this one up. Meg, thanks again so much for coming by. And of course, to everyone out there who spends your time with us every week, I know it's a lot to ask and I greatly appreciate the time and attention. And we'll talk to you all next time.